Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Martin, this is Max. We are both engineers at uh, Neo4j. And in the previous talk, Stefan talked about features of OpenCypher. And in this talk, we will show you how some of those uh, features are implemented in our Cypher for Apache Spark implementation. So um, this is a team. So it's Max and I. And then Max is our team lead, Stefan, former team lead. And also Philip is working on that project. So why Cypher for big data? I mean, if you know Cypher, then you probably also know Neo4j. And Neo4j is a transactional database uh, for OLTP workloads. And that's where you typically position this database system. However, many of our customers also have data lakes and already use big data tools for data integration. So ETL, as you probably know it, and, and also large scale analytical processing. So more like OLAP. Uh, and we uh, were thinking about how can we help those people uh, with Cypher, which they are used to because they are already customers, uh, how can they use Cypher within those two scenarios? So, and the typical big data applications that we see uh, is just a, just a collection here, collect data from user interactions at websites, or typically that they use internal data from their companies and uh, put them together to do some analytics like billing, marketing, uh, ERP system data, and so on. Or they combine it with external data, ontological data, for example, and of course, the goal is to uh, improve customer targeting, supply chain optimization, fraud detection, and so on. So all the, uh, all the uh, graph use cases, but at large scale. So in a common framework that you see in this uh, environment is Apache Spark, uh, yeah, a distributed data flow system. And we thought about, OK, how can we help uh, with Cypher? How can we help those big data analytical applications? So one uh, pillar is uh, data integration. So here you want to be able to use multiple large-scale data sets uh, within your analytical program. Uh, you want to retain and reuse intermediate results between queries. You want to integrate data from multiple data sources, so not only HDFS or, in our case, Neo4j, but also maybe a relational database, and then just get it into a single program and start your analytics. And of course, you want to support heterogeneous data. And the second pillar is, of course, complex analytical processing, which means that you have building blocks that, uh, which are Cypher queries, and then you want to compose them to build up your complex workflows. And what's also nice about a system like Spark is that you can integrate uh, our library with any other library that, also, that is already available, so like for machine learning, graph processing, graph X, or your own domain-specific uh, business logic. And of course, Spark itself gives you all the nice features of distributed um, execution uh, on a shared-nothing cluster, typically. So here we introduce CAPS. CAPS is a Scala library, Cypher on Apache Spark. Uh, and its main use case is, of course, to execute Cypher uh, on these distributed graphs. Uh, you can integrate it in your Spark uh, analytical pipeline. At the moment, we support uh, different data sources. So for example, you can pull in your data from Neo4j into the Spark environment, or you have your graph stored in HDFS or your local file system in a CSV uh, format, which we support. And it can handle heterogeneous data, and it's already uh, able to compose Cypher queries, which you will see later in an example and in our demo. So CAPS is built by Neo4j, and we donated this to the Open Cypher community that Stefan introduced in the previous talk. It's uh, already uh, released on GitHub, uh, Apache 2.0 licensed, and we are planning a, a release, GA release, on mid-May, uh, where we have the supported data sources for Neo4j, HDFS, and Hive. Uh, so we can also use SQL to get data out of Hive into our system. And for the rest of 2018 or beginning of 2019, we also want to add more data sources. So for example, relational DBMS like Oracle, Postgres, and so on. And also uh, support systems that are basically Kremlin focused, but we have a, a translator from Cypher for Kremlin, which you can use to also use data out of those systems. OK, so let's uh, get a bit more technical. So. Um, What's the architecture? So um, as you see on the top, this is a regular Cypher query. It's just uh, looking for a person which loves a specific system, in this case, uh, Neo4j. And there's an optional match, so this person might also love uh, Spark. And we want to return the person and the two systems. So um, we have a multi-layer architecture within uh, CAPS. Um, we start, of course, with uh, passing the query. For that, we use the Open Cypher front end, which is a shared module, which is also used by Neo4j. So that uh, gives you, you take the, the string in and get the abstract syntax tree out. And it does all the parsing, rewriting of the query, and some algebraic optimization. Then there is CAPS. Uh, CAPS is mainly um, 
used to translate the AST, the abstract syntax tree, into something that can be executed on data frames, which is the abstraction that Spark gives you. So it's basically a translator between those two, two things. And it also gives you the ability to import data, of course, export data, and we also have uh, schema and type handling, because uh, as you might know, data frames have a fixed schema, and an e j or property graph in general doesn't have a fixed schema. So there needs to be some uh, handling between those two worlds, which I will explain later a bit. And then after CAPS, when we have our data frame program, we just hand it over to Spark, and Spark has this nice thing uh, called the Catalyst Optimizer, which is a rule-based optimizer for query optimization, which gives you some uh, improvements on your, on your runtimes, probably. And then at the end, of course, the Spark runtime, which executes the query on your cluster. So this is the high-level um, view of the system. Okay, so we had some, uh, you have some, uh, as I already mentioned, there are some uh, different differences between uh, Neo4j and Apache Spark, or in specific, the data frame API. So at first, uh, let's talk about the graph format. Neo4j, as you might know, is a so-called native graph database, which means it's built up from, top to the, uh, from bottom to top optimized for graph operations. So the storage layout uh, and up to the query language is all optimized for graphs, whereas data frames, which is the abstraction in Apache Spark, is more like a table in a relational DBMS. So it has a fixed schema. You have the relational operators like join, union, and so on. And that's, of course, uh, a gap there. Yeah, as I mentioned, the operators, uh, we have relation operators on the Spark side, and we have native graph operators on the Neo4j side. So, for example, expand is an operator where you get all the relationships of a specific node, or var expand to compute uh, a variable length path expression. So, like, someone knows someone over 1 to uh, 10 hops. Then the schema, I already mentioned, we have schema optionality on the Neo4j side, so we have some constraints on the schema, but you can also have... Uh, even for the same label for a node, you can have a different kind of schema for that, so different kind of properties. On the Spark side, this is all fixed. And then, of course, there's the type system. We have the cipher type system, and on the other hand, the Spark SQL type system, which are not uh, compatible by default, so those have also to be mapped. So let's talk about a few of those challenges. At first, uh, about the schema. So, as I said, we require a schema for Spark data frames. And if you use, for example, our HDFS data source, uh, which I said is a CSV, then, of course, you have already a schema available, which is explicitly defined. And we can just derive it from there. If you, for example, load your data out of Neo4j, we uh, implicitly infer the schema while loading the data. So we build it up while we see the data. And, for example, if you look at this graph here, I hope you can see some of it. It's not that complicated. Just uh, two persons that know each other, and they... Uh, love uh, different systems, and for that example, a schema would look like this. You have the node labels, uh, for example, person, and a person has two properties, name, which is of type string, and year of birth, which is of type integer, and it's nullable because not all persons have the year of birth uh, property key. And then there's also the employee label, and the employee is an implied label. So if someone is an employee, he, al he also is a person because those two always uh, appear together. So person employee also has the name property in that example here. And then the same for relationship types. You have the nose relationship between those two persons, which has a specific uh, property key since of type integer. The second challenge is the graph representation. So from a logical point of view, you have the property graph. So how do you represent that in uh, data frames? And data frames, as I said, are tables. So we chose the concept of node and relationship tables, uh, which are constructed by label. So in that example, we have one table for persons and one table for the systems that you see on the bottom. And the employee, for example, which I said is an implied label, so it always occurs together with the person label, is just an additional column in that node table here. Uh, it's a Boolean column, so it's just true-false if that person is also an employee. And then you have all the properties here, so like you would also model it in a relational database, of course. So And then you have null properties for those optional um, property keys here. Same for relation, uh, relationships, uh, relationship table, as we call it, where you, in addition, also have uh, the source and the target or start and end node identifier uh, of this relationship and then also the properties that this relationship might have. Okay, the next challenge is uh, query translation. So, again, we have our uh, Cypher query here. And the physical view is, um, of course, query um, optimization or 
carry engine um, query engine handling in general. So we have on the left side our input, which are the node tables that I just showed you, and then we have a series of uh, operators, and in the end we have a result, which is the result of our query. So this is basically uh, where the magic happens within the system, and uh, today I want to explain some of this magic at least. So on the left side you see the same architecture as before. It's a high-level view of the system. Here is CAPS. And within CAPS we have um, four phases of query planning. So the first phase is a so-called uh, intermediate language phase. Uh, it's an intimate representation of the query, which is backend agnostic, because one, one other goal besides doing that on Spark is um, being able to port this, uh, this, um, this uh, project to other backend systems. So maybe a, a, an in-memory system or Apache Flink, for example, something like that. So this is an a backend agnostic query representation at first, so we translate the AST into that, and then we start with logical planning. So this is all. This is still um, craft-specific operators. So on the logical planning side, you still have operators like expand, var expand that I mentioned before, and we do some basic additional optimization uh, to what the front end is already doing at this place. Then we have the flat planning. The flat planning is the the, the step where we translate uh, or where we compute. The, the, col the column layout of the resulting uh, data frames. So if you, for example, do an expand, uh, so go from a node to their relationships, then you need to compute the column layout for the resulting data frame, so the schema, basically. And this is what the flat planning does. And then in the physical planning, this is where we actually translate the graph native operators like expand, var expand, and so on into data frame operations like join, select, distinct, and so on. And then, of course, like I said before, this is handed over to the Spark engine again, is being optimized by the Catalyst optimizer and executed by the runtime. Okay, and when you finish a query, you have, of course, the result available, which is again a data frame, which we call a cipher result, which contains uh, each row represents one result. So in that case, we wanted to return the, uh, the user and the two systems. So for example, Alice here, as you can see, loves uh, Spark and Neo4j, and Bob uh, only loves Neo4j, so the rest of the uh, uh, row here is uh, filled up with null values. Okay, so now that we know some internals at least uh, of CAPS, we want to talk about the API before we show you the demo. Um, so we try to um, adapt our API to, or make it pretty similar to what uh, Spark already provides to you or with the data frame API to make it especially easy for people that are uh, used to Spark to also use uh, CAPS. The central point um, is the so-called CAPS session as analogous to the Spark session. And this is the minimal program to run uh, a Cypher query on Apache Spark. So on the first line, for example, we just create a local session which instantiates the Spark cluster and so on. And then in the second line, uh, we specify a data source by just saying session.read from, and then we give them an, a URI where the scheme defines which kind of data source that is. So in that case, you might not read it, but it's HDFS plus CSV, which uh, internally triggers the right uh, code path to read, uh, to get the right reader for this uh, kind of graph. And then the address where it's stored within HDFS. On line four, we actually, line four is actually line three, but whatever. Um, it actually triggers the query. And on line five, four, we trigger the uh, we print the result, which of was, uh, would uh, lead to that uh, console output that you can see here, as you uh, are used to from Neo4j. Uh, then there's the second example, which of course is just available for the first row to read. <laughs> uh, so on the left side, yeah, sorry about that, but mm. on the left side, uh, this is just regular Spark code to create data frames on top. Uh, just trust me, this constructs a node data frame and this a relationship data frame with some schema. And then on the right side, uh, this is the, uh, the program that actually uses those data frames to run a query on it. And we use a concept called entity mapping, which is basically just a mapping between the column names in the Spark data frame and the concepts that we need to construct nodes and relationships from that. So we, you have to tell uh, us where to find the node ID, for example, where to find a specific property key in which column, and uh, same for relationships with addition of, of course, start and end node key. So it's pretty simple. So, and that's the goal of uh, an API. Um, Stefan talked before about uh, multiple graphs. Um, 
This is an example that is uh, also currently available in CAPS uh, that you can run, which involves multiple graphs. Uh, Max will give you a more advanced example later, but it's just to give you the idea. So what we do here is we take two graphs, uh, we mount the first one from HDFS, and the second one is coming from NeoVJ, indicated by this bold scheme in the URI, and two queries to get the data out of NeoVJ, and we store them at two, uh, two paths, my HDFS graph and my Neo graph. And then within the query, we can say, from my HDFS graph, give me all the employees, and from my Neo4j graph, give me all the persons, and then join those two graphs where the users, or the persons and the employee have a matching email address. So we do data integration, basically. We have two graphs separate, HDFS, Neo4j, and we join them together based on some knowledge that we have about those two graphs. And then we return a new graph, uh, which creates a new relationship between the employee and the person set match, and create a new relationship called same as. And then this graph is used with an, uh, with an additional query that you can see here. So it's also an example for composition because this is the first query, this is the second query that we trigger on uh, the result of the first one. Okay, this is the concept and uh, Max now will show you a more advanced example, a running example of that. Okay, so before we can start the example, I just want to set you all up with the scenario we are talking about. Um, so let's assume we are a company and we want to do a um, um, marketing campaign in specific uh, metropolitan areas. And we have access to two data sets. Uh, one data set is a social network. It's a uh, generated social network in our case, which we split up into two regions. So we have um, our social network is uh, once partitioned into the um, North America part and the Europe part and we store it in uh, two Neo4j databases just for scalability and for um, performance optimization. And then on the other side we have a uh, customer data set. So it's customers who have bought products. Those products are also categorized into product categories. And on the social network side, of course, we have people who know one another, who live in uh, certain cities, and they're interested in uh, different uh, interests. And as you can already see, um, we have a shared attribute across those um, data sets. So people on the uh, social network side, as well as customers on the product side, both have an email address. And this is where we can connect those data sets. So what we do is we assume that um, if a person on the social network side and a customer on the product side have the same email address, they are the same person in, in reality. So they are the same, they represent the same entity. And uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that the product data set is uh, stored in HDFS just to make this example a bit more um, complex or like uh, diverse. So and what we want to do is um, we load the data from their uh, corresponding data source, as I said, Neo4j and HDFS. Um, we extract uh, subgraphs that only uh, contain the data con uh, concerning those metropolitan areas we want to target. In our case, this is uh, New York City, um, San Francisco, Berlin, and Stockholm. And then we merge those two graphs uh, on, the on the email attribute, and then we um, compute recommendations. So we want to um, recommend users products that their uh, friends have bought and which as uh, their friends and the user both are interested in. Yes, um, that's basically our setting for the demo. And now let's switch to Zeppelin. So Zeppelin uh, is a data science tool um, which allows you to run um, Spark queries in an interactive fashion, and we have adopted uh, caps so that we uh, somewhat uh, support Zeppelin, and we can use it for our demo. Uh, is this is it big enough? Is it readable from like at least some places in this room, or should, should I increase the font size even more? Okay, uh, I'll leave it as it is. So what we've did, what we what we've already done is we've imported all the. Um, 
all the caps libraries. Um, it's like the, the cap session. And we have this special uh, Zeppelin support class here just for the Zeppelin. And we've already created the cap session. And what we start is we have to, what we start with is loading the data sets. So we first read our um, graphs from Neo4j. This is done in those first two lines. Uh, just run it here because sometimes it takes a while. And so we read the data from Neo4j um, from the two regions, and we read the data from our product data set, which is done here. So you see this is using Bold, which is the Neo4j um, scheme. And then we have HDFS and CSV. So we tell our, our system this format is stored in HDFS and uses our custom CSV format. And then what we do here, this is somewhat analogous to the uh, mount call that Martin showed previously. So we have our graph, and now we store it in the session under a certain name, or in our case, currently this is in a URI, so we can later use it from within the Cypher query. So we can, from within the Cypher query, we can reference that graph, change our input graph, and now read from a different uh, source. So this uh, worked, I guess, yes. And now let's start with some simple queries to show you just the, this is like the Cypher 9 Cypher capabilities that we already support. So let's take our social networks and have a look at um, the distribution of interest in, uh, in our cities. So both for, for New York City and San Francisco, as well as Stockholm and Berlin. And what we do here is we select all people and their interests, and then we group by city name and interest. And let's have a look how people or what people in those cities like. So it's also to kind of demonstrate how nicely this integrates with uh, Zeppelin. So you can do your Cypher queries, which are quite readable, and then you get a quite nice uh, visualization of that. So what we see is here in New York City, the interests are more or less evenly distributed. Um, San Francisco is somewhat more old school. They seem to like videos more than DVD. I guess this is like real videos, like VHS. And uh, they don't read as many books. But I mean, it's artificial data, so it's just just for this for the fun. Um, looks almost the same for Berlin and Stockholm. Um, what we do now is um, to make our lives a bit more easier, we extract those metropolitan areas. So we don't want to look at all the cities that are available in our data set, but as I said, we just want to target those four cities. So we extract graphs um, of people who live in one of our target cities. And if two people live in the same city and know one another about one or two hops, that is, they are friends or friends of friends, then we create a new graph with a, an edge between those people. So they, from now on, they live in, a, they live in the same like, social circle. And then we return that graph. Um, let's run those queries. And here we have. Uh, not a table representation anymore because we, we, don't, we don't really return a tabular result, but we return a graph result. We return a new graph. So what we get here is a visualization of the new graph. You see those two communities. I guess one of them represents all the people living in New York City. The other one, all the people living in San Francisco. And they're all somewhat connected if they know one another or their friends know one another. Um, to run this as well. Um, now, what we now do is we combine those two graphs. So, so far we always uh, worked with the two different data, social network data sets. So we had the one for New York, the one for um, Europe. And we now want to combine them into a, a single graph, just because it makes life easier for us. And we again store this combined graph in, uh, in our session using the friends UI. And now we do merge the two data sets. This is where the multiple graph capabilities uh, come in handy now. So we start by reading from our friends graph. So this is uh, what we use now. We use this feature graph at friends. So we, we tell the system, for now I want to read from the friends graph. And we find all people and uh, access their email address. And then we switch our input graph from, from now on. We keep the results that we have computed so far. But everything but that, that is going to happen now, all reads that are going to happen now, are done using the products graph. So again, we find all users and their email addresses. And now we do a cross product so, or a value join. So we find people 
and users that have the same email address. And for every tuple that we create, we create a, a new graph with an is edge. So user is a person, is the, or is the same person. So up until now, we have done our um, we have done our um, ETL, so we had, uh, didn't I do that? No, no I, I did it already. Um, so this was all ETL stuff, so we had our input data, our more or less raw input data, and we've transformed it so that we can now do our analysis. Um, first, we have to combine all the data into a single graph. Just makes it easier again, because we also want to access the person attributes and the and their interests and stuff like that so we create one large graph and use this graph to do our our analysis so what we do is we find people that are in the same um, social circle and have and like a certain interest and then if the user is the same as a user uh, or if the person in the social network is the same as a user in our uh, products database and has brought a certain product that belongs into a category which he, which his friend likes, then we recommend his friend this product. Um, and then we also, ra we also rank those uh, recommendations by the number or by the, by, the, by the ranking or rating of the product and how many or how helpful those votes actually are or how, um, how many uh, votes a certain rating has gotten. Um, yes, and then we execute this and can actually visualize it in a table. This takes a while. Um, I'm running it locally on my laptop right now. It's, it's a graph with a couple of thousand uh, nodes and uh, a couple of ten or hundred thousand edges. Um, yeah, and as I said, we started with a, we started with two like raw input data sets, we combine them using some uh, ETL capabilities and then using the same language that is Cypher, we could also do a, an analysis um, of the data and do some analytics. And here we are, we now have a table um, with recommendations. So what we see is we could that we could recommend Billy Anderson with a certain email address and we should recommend him to buy the book, The Life of Pi. Yeah, that's so that's all for the demo for so far, um, and also for our talk. Um, as we said, um, no, that's this slide. Um, we thank you for listening, and we welcome you all to check out our project. It's on GitHub, as we said. It's uh, open source licensed. You can use it. It's still in alpha, so we are constantly changing stuff. So don't rely too much on on certain details. We are finalizing the API right now, so this is somewhat stable already. And not only if you're interested in Apache for Spark, but also if you're interested in implementing Cypher on another system, check out our project. We try to keep our project in a way that it's easy to reuse all parts, like up to the, like, depending on how your, how your backend is structured, you could, if your backend is like relational also, then you can use quite a lot of our project, all the schema trans, translations, all the, uh, header calculations, or if you if you just want to do your in-memory database, then you can just use the front and the intermediate representation, and then you're already quite a far step from just having to do all the uh, implementation on your own. So both, if you're interested in Spark or want to implement Cypher, check out our project and contact us if you, uh, us if you have any questions. Thank you. Please see it for the questions. So five minutes of questions. Anyone for uh, Max or Martin? No. Okay. If there are no questions, Max. Oh, that one. Okay. Ah, okay. Scala. What do you say? Why Scala? Uh, because Cypher is written in Scala, and uh, I, uh, uh, the question was uh, why Scala, and uh, yeah. Well, is Spark, so Spark is, easy, uh, is easiest accessible from Scala. It's also possible with Java, but it's just nicer with Scala. And also the rest of uh, Cypher uh, on the Neo4j side is also written in Scala, so it just makes our life a whole lot easier. Is, is that a new version of Zeppelin that you're using, or do you use an extension? That, uh, uh, yeah, the, Ze so the Zeppelin, yeah, it's, uh, the version of Zeppelin is uh, a preview version, so 0.8.0 snapshot or something like this. Um, 
just because it has this nice uh, network or like graph representation. Um, on our website, uh, on the GitHub project, there's a wiki link on how you can integrate uh, Zeppelin, uh, Caps with Zeppelin, and we explain also, I think, in, in some short detail how, to, how you can build the, the snapshot version, but you can also use it with the current uh, yeah, stable release. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the, the Zeppelin support for graphs and Neo4j was done with by one of our community members in Italy. And as soon as Zeppelin 8 is out, or yeah. 08 is out, you can all use graphs with Zeppelin, which is really cool. <coughs> Just also, also Yeah. Uh, they have plan, they know or have plan how to efficiently distribute the graph and the Spark to improve the Spark capabilities to uh, make par parallel computation on the multiple nodes. So. The question was that we uh, already looked into, I guess, what you mean is uh, graph partitioning, so yeah. how to smartly yeah. partition the graph over HDFS. Uh, not yet, uh, but it's on our roadmap for the next time. So it's part of our performance tuning, of course, and this is mostly related to performance to have a good partitioning of the input graph and also recompute partitioning during query execution. So that's, uh, yeah, on the roadmap. But currently we only rely on what Spark gives us by default, which is, I guess, hash partitioning. Yeah. So the open cipher implementation for this is in Scala. Uh, does that mean if you were to want to write your own open cipher uh, implementation to interface with your own sources, uh, is there only um, like uh, libraries and tools available for Scala, like the parser mm -hmm. or whatever? Is it only for Scala, or are there other um, uh, language Good libraries question. available? I can take this maybe. Um, and so the question was: Is the only tooling for writing open implementation? Oh, yeah, I need to say. Uh -huh. So. The question was if the uh, tooling available for writing your own cipher implementation, if that's only available in Scala. That's not true. So the TCK is language agnostic. So the, test, the set of test suits that your implementation needs to kind of uh, conform to, to be a good implementation, is, is completely language agnostic. Also the EBNF uh, or the grammar is available as an EBNF grammar and as an Adler grammar, so you could easily generate a parser for all kinds of languages. But uh, the layer beyond that is currently only available in Scala in an open source implementation. But I know of one more open source implementation or implementation that's going to be open source that's coming out. It's actually not from Neo. And so, you know, watch the space. I think more things are going to happen, right? So th that's the other side of it. But you get some starting tooling from us. So you could do it if you want to, right? Okay. <coughs> cool. Then thank you so much for your time. Uh, next in